Uh, first of all, I want to thank Egan for inviting me to present here. It was really a pleasure. Uh, I am Rashid Abu Halaka. I, um, I have a master's degree in um, health management and disasters. I also have a master's degree in pharmacology, and right now I'm pursuing my PhD in pharmacology. I had um, a working experience with WHO before for almost like four years. Right now, I'm only working in Hajjat Abba University. Uh, my uh, research on refugees topic right now, it's in a mental health topic. Maybe I can uh, talk about it in the next session. But right now, I want to talk about the language barriers. It's a huge topic. I worked on it on WHO, and I worked on it in um, Hajjat Abba University as well. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about the situation of refugees. Uh, then I will go to the language barriers. I will explain a case study here in Ankara about the Syrian refugees. And after that, we will talk about the pandemic and what changed in the aspect of language barriers. Uh, I will present in English, but you can feel free to ask in Turkish or in the discussions or the questions later, you can ask in Turkish as well. I just feel more comfortable to present in English usually. Uh, Turkey before the refugee crisis, Turkey have a huge experience actually with refugees movement. The Syrian refugees wasn't the first time uh, that happens in Turkey. However, because um, this refugees uh, experience wasn't uh, huge enough as the Syrian refugees now. So Turkey doesn't have a very huge experience with uh, response to such a huge number of refugees as the well. Another factor is that the previous refugees who came to Anadolian uh, lands before, most of them, they have um, similar cultural and similar language to the ones in Turkey. For this reason, I guess the Syrian refugees was a little bit a new experience uh, for the for the Turkish government. Uh, I also want to take talk about the healthcare system in Syria before the war. If we're gonna talk about the Syrian refugees, it's really important to know what's special about the Syrian refugees. The healthcare system in Syria wasn't that much powerful and it was under growing pressure even before the war. That means like the healthcare uh, system couldn't provide healthcare services to all of the citizens even before the war. And that's because the government wasn't very supporting of the uh, health system. Also, there was too many chronic diseases. Almost 10% of the Syrian population was having um, uh, at least one chronic disease. The health professionals number was insufficient as well. And uh, lastly, the most important one, uh, there was regal, irregular distribution of medical and healthcare services among geographical areas. It means like in big cities or in cities, there was moderate healthcare systems. However, in villages or in the countryside, the healthcare system was uh, very, very much worse than in the cities and in some cities here in Turkey now when there's refugees that they are coming from uh, countryside in Syria, the, you can notice that there's a huge difference in their health status between uh, the refugees who were coming from the big cities. The refugee crisis, I'm not gonna talk about it a lot. I guess most of, the, most of you has heard about it a lot in the seminars. Uh, it started in 2011, uh, almost five, million people uh, immigrated, but that's like four years ago. So this number is not very accurate now. In Turkey, the last documented number was 3.6 million, but I think now it's more than 4 million, especially that there's many refugees who are not registered. Uh, nearly 90% of the Syrian refugees in Turkey, they live outside the camps and they live in different cities. However, Turkey stands up for the Syrian refugees and they give them free access to healthcare services and free medicines. Uh, the refugees and health in general, if we're gonna talk about this topic, 
It's very vital for immigrants to receive proper healthcare service because this can affect both the refugees and the host community. For example, uh, if, uh, sorry, uh, the immigrants generally have a much worse health situation than the citizens because usually they have long journey to take, they suffered a lot in the war. They came from, as the Syrian situation, they came from a country that they didn't have a very good healthcare system anyway. So their healthcare system uh, couldn't provide them with the necessary services. So their health situation is much worse. And for that, it's really important to provide them with the healthcare systems because if we can provide them now with the primary healthcare, it will be much cheaper if we provide them with surgeries later, if they have serious healthcare system. So it's more cost effective results to provide healthcare systems in early stages. Also, when you provide healthcare systems to refugees, uh, you reduce the hospital hospitalizations period and also you, uh, the events of infection. And now we can see this, it's a very important point during the pandemic, because if you don't provide a proper uh, healthcare systems to the refugees, the infection number will be like really high between them. And that can affect even the host community, not just the refugees. Uh, to talk about barriers in accessing healthcare system, uh, the barriers are not just in Turkey, the barriers in every country who are hosting refugees, they are always barriers to access healthcare systems. Uh, these barriers uh, provide the refugees from getting an optimal healthcare systems. Because even if they can access the healthcare system, like the case in Turkey, because it's free, they cannot get the optimal service because of these barriers. Uh, these barriers generally, they are the, um, separated into two categories. One of them, they call inherent barriers. Like I put some examples, but there are many inherent barriers. One of them is genetic. For example, um, let's say that there's refugees who are coming from the US and he's suffering from peanuts allergy and if he go to the hospital in Turkey with an allergy case they will not suspect the peanuts allergy first so that's um, kind of barrier for this patient another example let's say like if you use hypertension drug it can be really effective if you are an uh, african-american but if you are like uh, from latin american countries it cannot be effective on you that's genetics barriers and there are many examples for that that they are uh, uh, inhibit receiving the optimal healthcare services the cultural one which i really see that's really important the case of the syrian refugees in turkey because you know some of the communities they prefer to have uh, if they are male, they prefer to have a male doctor. If they are females, they prefer to have female doctors. Uh, some of the patients in some cultures, they may, when they get sick, they don't go to the doctors. They just go to the religious reader or they go to the, like, the head of the family or just they use herbal plants to, to care themselves. So the culture is really important too. And the language barrier is inherent barrier as well. And we will talk about this barrier much in details in the next slides. Some barriers are acquired barriers. I'm not gonna talk in very specific about them like uh, changes in lifestyle. Let's say that he, uh, the person was working in his country and now when he's a refugee, he doesn't have a job. So he's sitting in the house most of the time. And for this reason, he gets sick more. He gets coronary disease more. Uh, the um, same thing for socioeconomic factors. Maybe he was rich in his country and now he cannot afford to go to the doctor. So uh, this is the general barriers in accessing healthcare services. I tried to talk about them in a very short way, but they are really, really wide topic. And now I'm just gonna focus on the language barrier. The language barrier creates health inequalities for patients. And as, uh, as you know, like the, the one health is the number one right for all humans. So everyone has, has the right to get health services and the language barriers unfortunately provide us from 
uh, doing this to all patients. Uh, if you look to the literature in, um, uh, in different countries, patients with language barriers always have fewer access to healthcare services. They have lower rates of physician visits and even, which is most important in our case, lower access to preventive services. This means they just not cannot get the treatment. They cannot get the vaccine. They cannot get contraceptives. So it's very important to be aware, not just for the treatment and the preventive services as well. Uh, even if they access the healthcare system, like just I said before, in the case of Turkey, because it's free, and even if they could manage to, to reach the healthcare system, they always have forced adherence to the treatment and the follow-up for chronic diseases. And that's normal. If you cannot understand the doctor what he's saying, you cannot know that you have to come after two months or you have to come next week or you have to take medications in a um, specific time. Uh, the same thing, uh, decreased comprehension of their diagnosis and treatment. Uh, many, many of the refugees now, if you go to the field and you ask, they tell you like, I have a disease, but I don't know what is it. He went to the doctor, the doctor gave him medications, but he couldn't understand what he is having or the doctor couldn't explain to him. So that's really annoying when you go to the doctor and you don't know what's happening. That means your satisfaction from this service, it will be increased. And that means even if you are sick, next time you will not go to the healthcare system. And that's a huge problem. Uh, and lastly, even uh, if they access healthcare system, they are increased medication complications because they don't know how to use the medication, especially that if, they, if there's like a way to understand the doctors, they maybe cannot understand the pharmacist. So like they cannot know how to take the medications and they can misuse the medication. Um, language barrier has another important role, which a lot of people, when we think quickly about it, we don't think about it. It uh, has a role in discrimination among patients. Uh, we can see this in a documented case between the Zimbabwean refugees in South Africa. In Zimbabwe, they speak English uh, as they do also in South Africa, but many refugees have reported that the nurses, even if they know English, they prefer to speak in their local language just because they want to discriminate the Zimbabwean refugees because they cannot understand this language. And when they speak English to them, the nurses show to them or to, they try to ignore them. So if you cannot speak language, it doesn't mean just you cannot understand your doctors. In some countries, it means that you get discriminated because of it. And um, uh, that's very important in countries where uh, most of the citizen or most of the population doesn't want refugees in their countries. And it can be an important problem in the hospitals too. Uh, then language barrier, if we're gonna look about the influence of the language barrier in healthcare services. Uh, mostly we're gonna think that it's affecting the patient health, of course, but as well it's affect the healthcare providers. For the patients, of course, if you cannot understand or if you cannot explain yourself, you will get misdiagnosed by the doctor. Uh, many, many diseases, they need uh, what they called clinical story in order to diagnose or even if they um, diagnose your problem, if, when they give you treatment and you don't understand how to use it, you will not get successfully treated. And this is very important in psychiatric clinics because diagnosis usually is like 90% dependent on the clinical story. So if you cannot understand the doctor or the doctor cannot understand you, so like all the visits, it's for nothing. You will get, you will don't get any benefits from it. Uh, also for healthcare providers, usually when you have a doctor, sorry, when you have a patient that he doesn't understand you, you cannot follow the general rules. For example, if there's like five minutes rule for every patient or 10 minutes rules, when this patient cannot understand the language, usually it takes half an hour to, to explain for him because you want to explain again and again, and you want to make extra effort for this patient. Maybe you want to write on a paper or maybe you want to use translator or something. And that's as extra efforts for the healthcare providers as well. Uh, the language barrier in healthcare, uh, mostly when we 
hear the language barriers. We think about the spoken language like the patient cannot speak or they cannot listen, but there's a very important part of it, which is not just the spoken language, it's the understanding of the written materials, which is really important in hospitals where there's many rooms there are, uh, you cannot enter them. There's like specific exits door, there's specific entrance doors, there's some biohazards rooms, and if you cannot understand the signs or if you cannot understand the written language, it's a huge problem too. It's especially in some countries where you, when you admit to a hospital, they use a form and you have to complete the form or fill the form in order to, to get admitted to the hospital. And if you don't know the language, it's really normal that you cannot write or you cannot fill the form. And that's another barrier to inhibit uh, the refugees from getting into healthcare systems. Uh, the language barrier in healthcare system also has another uh, tricky aspect that it doesn't affect all the refugees in the same way. Like, for example, some refugees ha are really has a very good socioeconomic status, so they can afford a private interpreter. Some of them, they can't. Uh, some of them, they know the language before. Some of them, they don't. So we should know that some groups between refugees are really vulnerable to the language barrier. We will see that in the case study when I'm gonna explain the Ankara study and the case of Syrian refugees. Um, many, many hospitals, many healthcare systems around the world, they use interpreter in the hospitals as a solution or a method to cope with the language barrier. However, in the literature and in the case study in Ankara and with the Syrian refugees, there are many disadvantages for this method. Uh, number one is insufficient number of interpreters. Usually they put just one interpreter in every hospital and it's impossible to, to like reach all the internal clinics, the external clinics, the laboratories, because there are many patients are coming and just one or two interpreters, it's really insufficient number. Also using family members and friends as interpreters. Maybe the refugee doesn't know the language by himself, but like their daughters, their sons, their parents, uh, but that's not very ethical in hospitals because especially like in some cultures, like when women go to gynecologists, they don't want their daughters or their husband to come with them. Or like, for example, if they go to the oncology clinics and they have really serious disease, they don't want family to know about it. So that's another ethical topic. They, they cannot use a family member or a friend to help them. The other thing is the interpreters are not available all the time. As I said, because of the insufficient number, probably. And you have to wait for like two or three hours just to get the interpreter. And then you have to wait like one hour to enter the doctor. And then when you reach, like when your um, turn come to, to enter to the doctor, the interpreter gets busy again, and then you have to go back home. Like it happens a lot in the hospitals, unfortunately. Uh, also, you may not feel comfortable using the interpreter because he's like a stranger person for using a doctor, especially in psychiatry clinics or like gynecologist clinics or clinics where there's like really um, very personal information. Uh, patients usually doesn't want to be an interpreter in the room. They want privacy. So that's another aspect from it. Also, the most important thing is patient interpreter relationship. That's a huge problem. We can see it in small societies because usually the interpreters, they are not from the hosting community who knows the refugees language. Usually they are the refugees who learn the hosting community language. So in, in small communities, there's a big chance that this interpreter knows the people who comes to the hospital outside the hospital in the community. And then when they come to the hospital, they have to share very personal, very private information. And maybe this interpreter would take it to, to say it in the community to, to their families and a huge problems will happen just because of the interpreters. Also the gender, as I mentioned before, some culture, they prefer to have interpreter from the same gender. If they are women, they prefer to to have a woman interpreter. If like they are female, they prefer to have female interpreter. If they are male, they prefer to have a male um, interpreter. 
Another uh, huge problem we face it too, the interpreters, that they are not retelling the stories pricelessly or explaining medical terms. For um, like this problem, we see it in every hospital. Most of the interpreters, they are not medical interpreters. They are just people who know the language. So when they try to translate the medical terms, they usually use different uh, topics, different uh, terms, and that leads to misdiagnosis and incorrect treatment. Also, at least in some studies, to anxiety between the patients because they they always scare that they will not get the right treatment because of that. Uh, another thing that uh, in in the literature we can see that using the same interpreter in the hospitals is very beneficial because people, as I said, they don't like to see strangers all the time. But also in some other studies, there's still um, some negative effects for this um, interpreter, even if it's the same person. As a conclusion, uh, appropriate solutions are needed to deal with the language challenges, but what is most important is that we need to do follow-ups to see if these solutions are working or not on the real life, because, you know, theoretically and uh, practically, they are really different. Sometimes uh, you think that theoretically this solution is really effective, but in real life, there's many factors that um, doesn't allow this fact, uh, this solution to be successful. Um, and if we cannot manage to deal with the language challenges and the language barriers, no matter what, how much strong healthcare system we have, no one will get to the healthcare systems. Uh, now I want to explain for you the example study. The example study, the title was Determination of Perceived Language Barriers in Accessing Healthcare Services According to the Syrian Refugees Visiting to Training and Research Hospital in Ankara. This study was um, uh, done like three, three years ago in two hospitals in Ankara. Uh, one of the hospitals was Ankara Training and Research Hospital. The other one was Numone Training and Research Hospital. I think this hospital is closed now. Uh, we, we applied like um, a survey of 38 questions with 22 participants in these two hospitals. Um, Syrian refugees in Ankara, there are about 70,000 people in uh, Ankara. Mostly they live in Altenda neighborhood. And Ankara Training and Research Hospital is much close to them. And also they have two interpreters. For this reason, we have many participants in Ankara Hospital, more than Numune Hospital. In the studies, we asked about the socio-demographic variables like the age, the gender, the education level of the participants. Also, we asked about the language variables, if they know the Turkish language, if they know another language, if they have friends or relatives who knows the Turkish language. As a result, uh, as I said, we have more participants in Ankara than Numune Hospital. In the middle age, they were 36 years old, so they were uh, relatively young. Uh, almost 80% of them were married. And the education level, 10% of them was graduated from a university. 20% of them, they, was, uh, they weren't not literate. Knowing Turkish language, and that's really interesting um, result, that only 11% of the refugees knew how to speak Turkish language. 50%, they said that they don't know Turkish language at all. Uh, for the learning place, the learning place of the language, 37% uh, they learned the language in workplace, 30% they learn it in social relationships, and only 17% they learned it from a free course. Uh, and also learning Turkish language was associated with foreign languages. Refugees who know foreign languages were more uh, likely to know the Turkish language. Refugees who were younger, they were more likely to know the Turkish language. Refugees who have Turkish friends, they were more likely to learn the Turkish language. And also refugees who are working were more likely to know the Turkish language. 77% of the participants, they think that language has a negative effect on access to the healthcare services. 
50% of the almost 50% of the participants, they didn't access healthcare system at least once, even if they need it. And that's what we talked about, that language barriers can makes people stop going to the hospitals even if they need it. And that's a huge problem in healthcare systems. Uh, the method they used to deal with the language barriers, almost 50% of them, they used a hospital interpreter. 13% used a private interpreter, uh, sorry. And 70% um, used a family or friends, while 20% of them, they just tried to explain their problems by themselves. Also 65% of them, they think their method of coping with a language barrier was effective. 50% of the participants, they said that they do not know Turkish language at all. And if we look to the literature, that's a very high number because usually if you look to a hosting country with refugees, usually the percentage is much lower of knowing the language of this community. But in Turkey, uh, the case is different and the number is really high, at least in Ankara. Uh, also, the working participants were more inclined to learn Turkish language than unemployed participants, and which gives a really importance to finding job opportunities for refugees. Uh, also, perception of language as a barrier was more common among participants who were married jobless, had no Turkish speaking relatives or had diseases. That's, that result was really interesting because these groups of refugees usually having uh, difficulty to learn the language. Like for example, if you, can, if you don't have a job, you cannot connect with people and it's normal to not learn the language. If you have no Turkish speaking relatives or if you have diseases, you are really not in a good condition to learn a language or if you are married, because usually when people are married, they try to communicate with them, with their family. You know, they speak the same languages, but single people tend to speak with their friends or to get to know new friends and uh, try to get new friends who speak Turkish because usually in, in the places where they live, there are Turkish people around, so they need to learn the language. Um, gender was, um, gender of the participant also showed that significant difference. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, female participants used to use um, uh, the friends and family members because they didn't like to use the interpreter, uh, where male participants prefer to use the hospital interpreters most. And that was really effective because the interpreters, they were males in the hospital. And as you can see, the females prefer to use their friends or the family member. Uh, also, Syrian refugees who had physically or mentally diseases, they used to use the hospital interpreters more than the rest because they used to come to this hospital a lot. And that means they know where is the interpreters, they know how to use them. And that means um, um, not, or like not giving written materials to the refugees can be a barrier for using the interpreters as well. Uh, now I want to talk about the pandemic. We, we talked about the pre-pandemic area. That was, as I said, the study like three years ago. But now during the pandemic, a lot of things has changed. Mostly the healthcare system changed because w, since WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic, uh, the virus has left its severe impact on many healthcare systems in many countries. Some of the countries, they shut down all the hospitals all the hospitals, all the healthcare systems, especially during uh, the first months of the pandemic. For that, healthcare facility, uh, facilities have adopted new measures to prevent the transmission of the virus. Some of these uh, measurements, like the use of telemedicine, which means like you cannot go to the doctor and uh, talk with the doctor face to face, you need just to call the doctor. I don't think they use it in Turkey too much, but like in Europe, that was the most used methods to access doctors and hospitals in, uh, in Western Europe, I guess, not in all of Europe. Um, also limiting entry to the patient only because usually uh, you can take, as I said, like a family member or a friend with you to the doctor. Now you cannot do that. And you need to stay far away from the doctor. You cannot talk from one meter or two meters away. You need to talk from sometimes 10 meters away from the doctor. 
Also, you need to use masks and face shields inside the hospitals, inside the clinics. And that's um, a new thing. It wasn't uh, obligatory to use uh, masks inside the hospitals before. Um, the language barrier has, has got much worse after the pandemic because of the COVID measurements. Like for example, patients cannot bring ad hoc interpreters. Ad hoc interpreters, it means the interpreters who are not professional or are not paid, like just someone you know, he knows the language, maybe a neighbor, maybe someone in the hospital, he knows the language and he came with you to translate for you. But now that's not possible because you need to enter the doctor just by yourself. You cannot uh, bring friends, you cannot bring family members. Uh, and that's even, even if you can bring them, maybe it will put an extra risk on these persons. And that's, that's another uh, aspect of this um, issue. Also professional interpreters, now they don't agree to work in high risk places. Like if you talk an interpreter to the hospital, he wouldn't go there because like, okay, you're gonna pay me, but like it's too much risky for me. So it's a huge problem for people who used to use private interpreters. Using interpreters service remotely, like on the phone, sometimes they, they use the interpreters on the phone, like the doctor called the interpreter or the patient called the interpreter. But that's not available in every countries, especially in not very advanced countries. Also, if it's, a, if it's available, it's a huge problem to talk through the phone and with the connection uh, problems with the charge of the phone. So it has many disadvantages as well. Uh, even if you can manage to find an interpreter who goes with you to the hospital, there are many, many challenges now during the pandemic and understanding a second language speech now is very challenging because you have to use social distancing. You have to talk with the doctor from at least like five meters away. And so you cannot hear very good is it, is it if it's a second language for you. The same thing if you are using masks and the doctor is using masks. And that means like talking uh, now it's really challenging. And hearing is it's more challenging for the people who doesn't speak the language as a native language. Uh, especially if you we think about the patients who are COVID patients and they already have pneumonia and they cannot breathe very well. They have to take deep breath, uh, deep breath to to speak. So can you imagine speaking a second language with with disease and with a mask and with a distance? So it's like understanding the language right now. It's really challenging. We need really a quick solution to to deal with the language barrier during the pandemic. So as a conclusion. Uh, more sustainable solutions to cope with the language barriers are needed, as I said. Uh, some of the solutions, I wrote just some of the solutions whose um, they were in, in the literature, like hiring bilingual healthcare providers who can, they can speak both languages. And that's what uh, we did in, in WHO like uh, four years ago. We hired not bilingual, but we hired um, doctors who can speak Arabic. They cannot, not all of them, they can speak Turkish, but most of them, they all, all of them, they can speak Arabic. And in this uh, solution, a lot of people were more so satisfied from the healthcare system rather than the interpreters because the doctor, if they can speak their own language, it's much uh, comfortable for them. Also another solution is, is increasing the level of language proficiency among immigrants. And that's, um, like giving obligatory language courses to refugees and they do it in some countries. Uh, you cannot get a refugee status if you don't learn the language. So some countries, uh, they uh, force you to learn the language. Uh, also, it's much, it's really necessary to have a better response to public health crisis, to have um, a plan to know how to do it before the crisis comes. Because when the crisis comes, you usually you don't have time to prepare. You don't have time to uh, to like tell everyone what to do. So you need uh, a plan before the crisis. You need to plan for everything. And you need to tell every, like every um, healthcare provider how, what to do during the crisis. You need to do a training for them to know that they are really are doing this 
during in a case of crisis or disaster. So uh, as I mentioned before, language barriers should be given more priority, particularly in societies where they are hosting a huge number of immigrants and refugees. Uh, thank you so much. That's what I wanted to present for you today. I hope I didn't take a lot of time. I don't have, okay, I don't have watch next to me. Um, now it's time for, if you have questions or discussions, I really would like to hear your experiences about this area. And if you have uh, solutions or uh, any questions, I'm ready. Uh, right now, I, I cannot see the chats for the questions. Uh, I will try to open it. I think I need to, to stop sharing the screen. Okay. If you have any questions, um, I'm ready. If you can write it or you can just say it. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I want to ask you something about the possible solutions. What do you think about hiring uh, Syrian nurses and doctors? Uh, as I know, uh, it wasn't possible them to work in Turkey when they first came, but the situation changed now. I don't know anything about it. Um, the Turkish healthcare system has a requirement that you, they cannot work in the system, like in the governmental hospitals at least, if you are not Turkish. So you need to be Turkish as a one requirement to work in the hospitals, the governmental one, not the private one. The private ones you need, or the governmental ones, you need to, to have an equation of your um, undergraduate degree to be able to work in that. And that's it's a huge problem for the refugees because most of them, they don't have their degrees with them. They just run away for their lives. Uh, in the case was, kind of an exception for the Syrian doctors and the Syrian nurses, that they made them work in a special centers so they can, um, they can like see patients from, uh, the patient who can speak Arabic, but they cannot treat Turkish patients. So these centers who where they are working, the Turkish nurses, sorry, the Syrian nurses and the Syrian doctors, they only can treat the Arabic speaking refugees not the normal citizens. And also they hire them after a training that lasts for six months. So they give them a train and they give them an exam and they already, they just hired the people who passed the exam. So it was kind of a short quick equation for their undergraduate degrees. Thank you so much for your answer. I have another question, but I can wait for other friends. Yes, please, you can ask. Okay, thank you. I don't think there's hands right now, no one. Yeah, please try. Do you think it's a problem for interpreters and patients? Like, uh, I, I remember that uh, it was a problem for refugee camps. Like, there were some local uh, people who speak Arabic, but it's not even uh, close to the uh, Arabic uh, speak spoken in Syria. So uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. So you are asking about the interpreters. Okay. I think the are interpreters- Are you experiencing some kind of hardship about this? Okay, uh, some, yeah, that's true. In the Arabic language, there are many dialects uh, and that can affect the um, understanding, the communication. Um, I Like the cases I saw in Turkey, usually there are Syrian interpreters. But in some in some cities, I guess there's Arabic interpreters who are not Syrian. They are speaking uh, different dialect. And in some cities, especially in the southern cities of Turkey, there are Turkish interpreters who used to speak Arabic before, but they speak a different Arabic than the Syrian one. That's true. Uh, it can make um, it can make um, uh, an extra uh, burden for the patient and for the doctors. But uh, I think interpreters, like usually, they should be, um, they have, should have a certificate to be an interpreter, especially in medical um, uh, systems, because you need to know the terms, you need to know, um, you 
need to know some some aspects how to do how not to do how to intervene how not to intervene so if uh, part of this certificated program it's to be understood well understood so uh, in the next step i think they are started to give certifications to the interpreters in the hospitals so i think in during these steps the people who cannot be understood they would be just uh, outside thank I think, you so much again you are welcome i think there is a question we can you can ask about oh sorry okay this is from I can ask something if Admin, I guess. no one yeah. First of all, thanks for your presentation. It was really enlightening in many sense. I wanted to ask about this uh, telemedicine issue. It was really interesting, but I was curious, are there no any uh, digital alternatives in this sense? Like interpreters, they have many, uh, they have many challenges in terms of like social communities and uh, not having, even finding one is problematic. So what do you think there that, uh, could we, I mean, improve an application in a health specialized way or like more like a digital solution hired by hospitals? Do you think is it possible or will it be efficient? I'm sorry, I couldn't catch the last part of your question because the internet was not stable. Okay, I just said, will it be efficient, do you think, these digital solutions like having an application okay. or anything on the mobile phone which can be easily accessed? During the interviews that we met from the refugee, um, with the refugees, they really complained from the phone interpreting because um, as I said, like in the hospitals usually it's really crowded and you get like five minutes or 10 minutes to talk with a, with a doctor. So you have to prepare your phone. You have to call the other person. The other person too should be free. And when you go to the doctors, you, you need to to talk with five minutes. And sometimes the doctor doesn't have time to, to like explain a lot on the phone because sometimes there's connections problem. Also in some hospitals, there's many clinics that are under the ground and there's no, no uh, like telephone connections. So you cannot, you cannot use the phone in the such clinics, especially that uh, many, many of the hospitals, they use the external clinics at the first floor or underground, so uh, it wasn't very uh, effective solution for that telemedicine. It's um, telemedicine like the medicine on the online or on the phone. It was a problematic too, even for the people who speak the same languages because the internet connection and like the phone connection and you don't understand, like sometimes you need the face expression to understand the other person. So it's normal for the for the refugees who doesn't speak the same language to be an extra load for them. It makes sense, but I was more like thinking of something with artificial intelligence actually, like you do in Google Translate, you are just speaking to phone and it is translating directly. I thought maybe there could be some like an application for it. I mean, it's a basic solution. That's true, but, but I think in medicine that's an extra hard because a mistake that can make by the app or a mistranslating by the app can lead to a huge problem. So I don't think any of the healthcare systems or any of the authorities will start to trust the using the artificial intelligence translating, especially that many, many diseases that, especially the rare diseases, they have very rare names and that's, you cannot find it in normal like in, in the current technology, maybe of course in the future there will be such thing, but right now, I don't think there's any system in the world who trusts the artificial intelligence in translating. Yeah, makes sense, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Hello, I have a question too. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is about interpreters. Uh, do you know any country uh, accepting refugees that um, have regulations about the interpreters in the hospitals or uh, to avoid any kind of language barriers in the hospitals? Um, I think language barriers is really affecting uh, many of the countries. In in US, you need to be certified to work in the hospitals and you need to have, I guess, undergraduate degree in translating. In, um, in Europe, because of the refugee crisis, the Syrian refugee crisis the last year, they start to hire 
uh, some interpreters who are not certified, but they, I guess they give them a uh, course like for six months before they start working in the hospitals. Um, I guess uh, the problem in, in all Europe is similar. They don't have a very, um, like very effective solution for the language barriers. Because as I said, there's no preparation. No one, no, no country was prepared to, for such a disaster. And when the refugees start coming in a huge numbers, they just start to make quick solution, like just hiring interpreters in the hospitals. But unfortunately, the solution is not the optical one. So, uh, sorry, the optimal one. So um, for this reason, um, I guess now in Germany, they start to use, to hire, uh, uh, refugees who are doctors or nurses, just like in Turkey as well, uh, especially in the pharmacies too. I guess in every farm, like most of the pharmacies in Germany, they have uh, a pharmacist or a pharmacist assistant who can speak uh, Arabic language or at least like a foreign language, let's say. Uh, but I, I already know the case of US because US was prepared for migrations because they have many people who speak Spanish in their country, like citizens. So I don't think the refugees who came from Latin America was a problem for them. They already have many, many uh, regulations written in Spanish, uh, many signs written in Spanish. But I think if they face like, uh, they also have many refugees from Arabic countries actually, but if they still like face, I know like a huge amount of refugees from a country that they are not prepared for, they will have the same problem. Thank you. And I'm also curious about the question written in the chat part about the COVID-19 vaccine. Yeah. I don't know much about how they apply these uh, vaccines to Turkish people and other migrated people in Turkey. Do you know anything about it? Uh, the vaccine uh, regulation are still not um, official in Turkey. I think you are asking the case of Turkey. Uh, the vaccine will be the Chinese vaccine. The vaccine uh, clinical trials was um, successful in Turkey, but it's not approved in Turkey. I think it will be approved for emergency, uh, emergency uses in the next two weeks, because now he is going under the safety um, test, the vaccine, uh, before they start applying to the public. But most likely the first uh, that will be just for the healthcare workers and for the old people, but some of the vaccines will be available in the private hospitals. It will be a little bit more expensive because I think it will be free in the uh, governmental hospitals and the governmental centers, but uh, um, there is a plan to, to make some of the vaccines available in the private hospitals as well. But until now, the vaccine, like everything, is not official because the vaccine didn't pass the safety tests. Thank you again. You're welcome. Can I ask a question? Of course, um, go ahead. Thank you for this informative uh, seminar, uh, let's say. And I have, I would like to ask about the project of uh, Minister of uh, Minister of Sağlık Bakanı Health. Uh, uh, there was a project uh, which is funded by uh, EU, uh, European Union, and it was called uh, Sıhhat. Uh, maybe you know. Uh, as I understand, uh, you on you only include uh, the government governmental hospitals in your research. Uh, my first. Uh, question is that uh, why don't you include these healthcare centers for refugees uh, with, uh, designed under uh, this project SUHAT? And uh, do we have any clear data about the SUHAT, SUHAT project? Like how many uh, Syrian doctors we have now and how many C Syrian doc doctors uh, we had in the past? Uh, I ask this because uh, uh, I listened to uh, another seminar in the past. Uh, we are listening a lot of seminars in this period, in this COVID times. And 
the speaker said uh, there was like 3000 uh, Syrian doctors in the past and we have only uh, 1000 now. And uh, I would like to ask a question, uh, a last question. Uh, do we can a comparison comparison between uh, the, the healthcare centers for refugees and the governmental hospitals for uh, governmental hospitals in terms of these language barriers or other barriers which faced by uh, refugees? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, to answer your questions, first, you need, I think I need to check the dates. Uh, the study was uh, the study that we did on the um, uh, governmental hospitals was in 2017. And I think in that date, the um, health centers for refugees wasn't open yet because the Sehat project was happening, I guess, in the same date. Uh, when I was working this project in WHO, uh, there was 460 doctors and like 1000 nurses. Maybe they hired more because I left WHO since like two years ago. So I think uh, I, I have no idea about the exact numbers these days. Uh, but I think, yeah, they are mostly more than 400 doctors and 1000 nurses because that's the one stage of the project. And then they take more, uh, more like, I mean, they hired more people. But unfortunately, then some specialists like for example, we, we still we don't have a psychiatrist who can speak Arabic. Maybe we have just one in all Turkey. So some some like oncologists or some like very specialist professionals, we still they are still not available, and that's a really challenging uh, part because, um, as I said, uh, being a psychiatrist it's a very important part. You cannot use interpreters there, and you really need someone who can speak the language, and that's. I guess that's one of the uh, most challenging aspect of the language barrier now in Turkey because there is no psychiatrist who can speak Arabic. Um, uh, the other aspect, I, I think I forgot your second part of the question. Uh, did I answer your question or? Yeah, uh, thank you for the answers. Uh, and. The second question is that, uh, can we do a comparison between uh, okay. the healthcare systems for refugees and the uh, governmental uh, hospitals in terms of these barriers? Okay. Now, for example, and I really clearly understand uh, the situation now because you said uh, we were uh, do this research in uh, 2017. And yes, the healthcare systems, healthcare centers established also in the same time yeah, yeah. Uh, that's true uh, um, i think who has initial data about the satisfaction in these centers they didn't publish it yet they they still working on it or they will publish it soon i have no idea but since two years ago they had they conducted a study during in these centers to see how much satisfactory is the surface there but if we look to the literature in, um, in, in general, like in other countries, you can find a comparison between using interpreters and using a bilingual healthcare providers. And you can find like there's no much very strong evidence, but you can find kind of an evidence that hiring a bilingual healthcare providers, it's much better than using an interpreters in the hospitals. By the way, if someone wants to ask in Turkish language, it's okay. I can understand perfectly. I just cannot speak very fluent. O zaman çok teşekkür ederim. Rica ederim. Can I ask something too? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so mine is more like a methodological one. So as I understood that you collected your data like three years ago and we came, like you also like listed some issues post-COVID. And so I was wondering if these, um, this list depends on just assumptions or you collected it, you know, you conducted another interview sessions or anyone else in literature already done this or are you planning to do it, to compare before COVID and after COVID? Uh, first, I didn't 
there is no study after COVID about the language barriers, not in the literature, not until two months ago. Uh, so this was, um, it's not, uh, it's kind of uh, interviews, like personal interview. It's of course, it's not an evidence because it doesn't represent all the people who are suffering from the language barrier. It's just the personal experiences. And also it's, uh, some of them, they are um, like, uh, you. I collect them from the news, from the, uh, they called case report studies. But this, all of these studies, all of these reports, they are just indicators. They are not evidence. Even, even the studies in the governmental hospitals we did, it's not an evidence. It doesn't represent all Syrian refugees in Turkey. It represents just the refugees who are visiting the hospitals. So we cannot talk about evidence. We can just talk about uh, probability. So if we need an evidence, we need a huger study. We need um, to take many, many uh, participants in the study and we need to do a better methodology. The, 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 our study doesn't prof provide an evidence, but it's provide essential information about the situation in the, um, in the governmental hospitals in Ankara. So we needed to do it fast. We needed to do it. Uh, that's why we couldn't use a very huge methodology in this study. I see. So are you planning to do it or to just have a comparison? In the language barrier, now we don't have any study, as I said in the study. So you, you're seminar. not planning to either. Because now I'm working on mental health. We have studies on mental health in refugees during the pandemic, and we have study on mental health situation in um, healthcare providers during the pandemic. Unfortunately, I'm not working the language barriers in um, in this time, but maybe in the future yeah, I can. It can be a really interesting topic. Okay. Yeah, I see. Thank you. You're welcome. If there's no more questions, I guess you already, I took a lot of time in presenting. I apologize for that. I guess there is no question. Uh, 